Are we up? Good morning, good morning, good morning. As you can see, we're up on the third floor. Actually, that stairway, the, the shelves behind me there. I no, that's the thing. I'm going to say half the stuff fell off. Not half the stuff. A bunch of stuff fell off here and there from that staircase during the quake the other day, the other night. We lost a few things from here. Not lost. They fell down. And then in my own room, the collection room, a few things fell off there. Other than that, we had no big deal. It was scary. It was noisy, actually. The windows rattled like crazy in an old building. So as soon as the quake starts, the rattling starts, and you think, oh my God, it's the end of the world. Okay. What are we doing today? Up on the third floor, we usually do sizing. It's not a sizing stream today. There's no nothing cooking, nothing going on. Yesterday was a cooking day supreme here, and I've got some uh, video of that if we have time to fit that in today. Today is something that we've never seen before. It's a job that I have to do today because Kubota-san is waiting for paper, and we've never seen this on the stream in all the years that we've been doing this. Today, we are going to see calendaring the paper. I've got some paper here for Kubota-san, and it's beautiful, beautiful paper. It's cut from the Takenaga size, which is the large, largest size, really, that Iwano-san makes these days. It's quite smooth, but it's thick, really thick, and the front surface is bizarrely rough. And the print we're going to be making from it, he's going to be making the Tagono Ura print which has lots and lots and lots of requirement for deep, smooth gradation all over the place, up and bottom. And if I send him this paper as it is, he will look at it and say, I can do this, but what he will have to do, he will have to do what's called the Udabadan work himself. He will get a blank wood block out. Uh, he may do it moistened, he may do it dry, I don't know case by case. We do it sometimes moistened, we do it sometimes dry. He'll get a blank wood block out, put the paper on it face down, and he will use his heaviest baron all over the entire sheet to calendar it by hand. It's hard, heavy, thankless work. He can do it. He's a professional printer. I phoned him last night. I said, you got a choice. He had wanted the paper on Saturday, and I had done the sizing. In order to get it to him on Saturday, it means shipping it Friday, so I had done the sizing late Thursday night. But yesterday we were running out of time, Friday, while we were cooking here. And I, so I phoned him, I said, Kabuta-san, you've got two choices. You can have the paper tomorrow, Saturday, if I ship it today, but it won't be calendar. And I told him about the job, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, maybe can we have it Sunday? And so I said, yes, if you can wait one more day, if you get it Sunday, I can press it on Saturday morning, ship it to you Saturday afternoon, and you'll get it. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> The guy is whatever, he's got a few years on him, he's 75 or something, and he would much prefer to have this paper smoothly calendar. So that's what we're going to do. The press is something we've had for 20 years or so. It's a, it's a Blick Econo Etch Model 2, as in not 2 with numbers, but 2 with, you know, the Roman numeral 2. It's a Blick Econo Etch Model 2. And I got it from Dick Blick Art Materials in Illinois online. I ordered it and it arrived in a crate from Brazil. Manufactured in Brazil. Item 45029-1001. It's been, it's performed really, really, really well for us with the qualification. We don't do etchings, so I can't guarantee that this is good for etching, but it sure does the job well for us for calendaring, although I have to qualify. There has been one problem with it. The metal base plate warps. It warped. So it obviously, so maybe as an etching press, this may mean this is you're out of the game. But it warped because maybe we were using it wrong. We just calendared paper, calendared paper, calendared paper, calendared paper. And it turns out that I didn't flip the base plate at all. And over the years, the base plate started to develop a curve. I guess all the pressure from the top roller up against the bottom roller, the the base plate started to curve up and down. What I then did was I flipped it, but that gave us a separate problem because the top roller is very slightly toothed, the bottom roller is heavily toothed. And over the years, as we'd been using it, the bottom roller had cut grooves in the base plate. So the base plate was no longer a beautiful, smooth surface. So once we flip the thing, we cannot then calendar our paper directly on the metal plate. Plan B, we now do our calendaring inside mylar sheets, and it works 
beautifully. So the scoring on the bass plate now doesn't matter to us. So we've got a routine. We now flip the bass plate every year or so to try and stop it from warping too much in one direction. It stays generally flat, our paper is smooth, and we are happy campers. And it's so much easier than doing it by hand on the back. It was heavy, it wasn't too bad. It didn't cost much at all, you know. I don't remember now, because it's only 20 years ago. It would have been something like $400 maybe, shipping included from Brazil. I don't know exactly, because it's a long, long, long time ago. We've had no other problems with it. We don't use the micrometer adjustments and stuff. We do it by hand, as you'll see. Anyway, let me do a bit of this. I, I haven't set it up this morning, so I've got to set it up first. And, and in order to help us see what's going on, we have two cameras. Look at this, look at this, look at this. It also probably should have been oiled and stuff a little bit better. Maybe you can see here from the top. tried going by the numbers, but there was just so much variability. So we just play it by ear. So four cameras and one's not working. I don't have another camera here. What else can I do? I can't put mine any different. I can't uh, drop it across. What can we put in there? I don't know. I've got photographs in the background here. <laughs> Let me get this set up. We'll think about that. Okay, now, for the for the for what we did, we do the Mylar sheets, and we use normal clear files. And we've got a clear file, and it's sealed at the bottom and sealed at one side, and it's open on the other two sides. So, base side towards the roller, paper in, face down. So base to the roller. If we put the base away from the roller, the pressure pops the seal at the end. So base towards the roller, paper face down. And we're going to do this with two passes. Now, I'm not sure because I haven't got the adjustment. So give me a chance to see what's happening here first. I think that's a bit too light. Let's see. Pop it through. Bring it out, flip it once, flip it twice. So it's now going to go through again, base to the roller, same pressure. Audio, extra audio. <laughs> and the reason we've learned to do it twice and we don't just go back and forth, a flip it, because there's no way I can adjust till the cows come home here, but I'll never get it exactly right with this way. So by sending it through this way now, flip and flip, we've had it go through in every possible orientation. Let me check against the light. We can go a tiny bit more. She is flat. I don't really have any way to show you, but she is now smooth and flat. It's not really going to show. It's a white piece of paper. But believe me, under the light here now, that roughness on the Iwano paper is gone. It is smooth and flat, and, and uh, Mr. K, and uh, Design, will be one very happy camper. If I was the person doing the printing work on this, what I would do is the same thing now. I would do this. And then after moistening the paper, I would come back to this press and do it again with a very, very light touch, just to put a beautiful final calendar on it. When you're pressing moist paper, you've really got to be careful. You can just destroy it. The paper is so soft, it can just be destroyed. This is dry today. It's dry. The sizing has been done uh, two days ago. Well, no, what's today? Today's Friday. 
the Teddy Sager. I did the sizing on Thursday. Calendaring it before sizing has no meaning whatsoever. It doesn't make anything. Check again, keep checking a few of them here. It is nice. He is going to be so happy. So happy. Okay, I have 88 sheets to do here today, so you have got to keep this, uh, you've got to keep us entertained here. We don't always calendar. We calendar when the paper is extremely thick, or when the surface is rough, or when we have extremely fine detail to print. Ishikawa-san is prepping to do a version of the Scent of Chrysanthemums print and she is going to calendar the paper twice, once dry and once wet. Was that top secret information? Ishikawa-san is starting a run of the Scent of Chrysanthemums as a challenge. Somebody say we have a visitor today. Ayama-san will be coming. This might be the last time you'll see her. You might see her. Yeah, it'll be the last time you'll see her because the camera finishes tomorrow and Ayama-san is coming this morning. The big one. Big one, John. The big one. Top secret. Cameron finishes tomorrow. So Ayama-san today, it's her last chance to talk to him. And she's coming at 9. sheets down 84 to go it's not going to be the most interesting job today but I have to do it so what's the clicking what's the clicking it's funny as I, I talked about the warping of the uh, warping of the base plate the base plate has mostly warped this way so as the thing goes through the rollers it gradually gets a curve I think if we kept on going for a thousand years the base plate would eventually turn into a turn into a circle there's something to do with the way it gets pinched between the two rollers but also, it has warped the other way, a little bit sideways. So this is not a 100% good positive review of this Dick Blick Econo Edge. I guess you get what you pay for, or we've misused it, I don't know. Anyway, the base plate has also warped a little bit in the other direction, this way. Just um, not, even, not a millimeter, a milli, 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 milli. So what we've done is again, we flip, 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 but now it doesn't go through flat anymore. So I've got some green tape. Can we see it? <laughs> this is heavy. I can't muck around with it too much. We have green tape in layers on the bottom of the base plate, layered up. One layer here, two layers here, one layer here, two layers here. We've got it to give us a flat surface on the bottom. And we have to renew it, renew it every you know, three or four times we use the press here. And it's the tape going through the pressure roller that is making all that popping noise. <laughs> Green tape to the rescue. I guess there's air bubbles going back and forth and back and forth. I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, now the schedule for today. This is actually not going to be all that interesting to watch the whole thing. So what I also want to do is this. Yesterday here was a cooking day. And I don't mean sizing, I mean cooking. I'll pop you up just one quick photograph here for a second. I'll photograph its video. Yesterday here today, we prepped our first batch of materials for starting the process of building a machine that will pick 
Chidi out of paper. We actually began yesterday. I took a ton of video along the way. We're gonna be making YouTube videos. I will be explaining what I'm doing. We have started this whole process. I, you know, I can't show you all the video things. We took like six hours of video yesterday. So what I've prepared, I've got in the back of my mind here a couple of clips, one or two or three. And it would be fun, instead of watching me press a piece of paper for an hour and a half, let's look at some video. So maybe let's do this till about, I've got to do this till about 8.45 or so. Then let's switch to some video. We can see 15, 20, 30 minutes of video or so, bit by bit by bit. Then we've got a show and tell thing prepared. So let's do that. Some of the, the, all of the video is unedited. It's just the raw camera clips. So some of it that we'll look at will be sort of camera moving around and then focusing and trying to do. But let's look at some of those. I think that's the way we should probably do this today. So it's a tease. It's not a tease. Let's look at it, but let's look at it in a few minutes. I don't have enough video prepared to show you for the whole show and tell to, for the whole uh, stream today. So let's do this. And it's looking like we can do this. I know there's Edison. What did he? Did somebody talk about the light bulb, and the guy came up with this light bulb. And I forget the numbers here. Just it's a story I read when I was a kid, probably over dramatic. Somebody said, "Wow, you're such a genius! You got this light bulb." And he said, "No, it's not genius. It's perspiration. We tried nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine hundred ninety nine times, and the last one was the one that worked." And we're at this stage with this chili toy. We we boiled this stuff up. We got ourselves some raw chili, and we tried playing with some plastic slides and stuff. And nothing we tried worked at all. But we learned a whole bunch. And we now are going to move ahead to the next step to try this. So we're at stage one of the of the of the process. You know. uh, it was a ton of fun yesterday. A ton of fun. Cozomatic. Hmm. It should be chitimatic. I don't know. I should pay more attention to this conversation. Did I get my email about the poet sets? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. And I cried myself to sleep last night. <laughs> Those sets you have are indeed from the second run, I think, without totally seeing it by hand. I can't 100% confirm, but they look like they're from the second run, which started in the year 1999 and went for five years. So those prints were made at that time. Those ones went out with no collector names on them. So the, the prints you've got there were made about 20, yeah, about 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago. And I was quite shocked by the pictures there to see the distortion from the moisture. And I'm really curious, because when we make those things in a relatively damp environment here in Japan, we make the folders, make the prints, set them up, but the pictures I'm showing there show an extreme amount of warping. And I'm not sure, is that climate? Where, where are you? Lots of ideas about this vibrating the pulp and stuff like this and all. I can't go right to the end of the story today, but the ideas, the different ideas that came up in the other stream about how the chidi should be removed. Until you see this, it's difficult to describe it. If it's a cup of fiber, fiber that is designed to mat together. The matting of the mulberry fiber, I originally thought was just simply when they dip it in and they shake it and they shake it, the fibers get tangled together. No, there's something chemical or, or at the you know, uh, electron level where the celluloses and what they call the hemicelluloses, where they bond together. And the fibers, even as we've got them in the solution, are already bonding together. So a little cup full of water with mulberry fiber in it with some chili inside is already sort of bonding into a thing, into a unit. 
And if you try to say, for example, centrifuge it, bang, it all just goes to the outside. Chili plus fiber. They are stuck, glued, messed together. So all the things that were mentioned here the other day, try zooming it, try vibrating it, try, try this and that, there's nothing that separates them. This stuff really wants to glop together. The other part is if you're trying to go in and take it out, anything that you put into the mix to try and take it out, whatever fiber it touches comes back with that object. If I've got a cup of fiber, we'll see this in the later ones, if I've got a cup of fiber and I dip my finger in and pull it out, it comes up coated with fiber. So the idea of going in and taking stuff out mechanically is really, really, really tough. Someone's combing, no, I mean, impossible. As I said, if I dip a finger and it comes covered with fiber, the idea of putting in a bunch of teeth going through this fiber, oh my God, no, it just will instantly, instantly clump up the stuff. And the other part of it is that we can't do anything that will destroy this clumping, because that's how the paper is made and that's where the strength of the paper comes from. So we want this to happen, but we want it to happen without the dirt in there. So this is really, really, really not a trivial question. How to get the chili out of there without touching the stuff? We can't actually touch the fiber. We've got to get the garbage out of it without touching the fiber. And this is why, I, you know, people have been trying this for generations. They've been trying to build this. As I said before, I don't know the actual numbers. I've been told that the culture ministry at one point sent money out to the group of workers in that area. Okay, guys, here, here's your, here's your support. Here's your X million dollars. Build a machine. They tried and nothing happened. Throwing the suggestions in, but I think we're going to follow the one that we have uh, settled on. We're going to disperse it very finely in water. We're going, uh, no, we're going to, to hammer it and disperse it with the chili in place. We're not going to try and mechanically take out the chili at the beginning. We're going to disperse it with the chili in place. So you've got a very liquid solution with what looks like a cloud floating in it with the black dots. We will send that through chutes. We will send it over a waterfall. As it's going through the chutes, the cameras will inspect, decide the spots where the chitty is, and from behind the waterfall, quick, short, sharp puffs of air. Well, as the thing falls over, the puff of air from behind will target the little zone where the black dot is. It's gonna puff it out of the stream. The stream falls into the good bucket, the dot that's been puffed falls onto the bad shelf. It will inevitably carry some fiber with it. That's going to be a question of adjustment. How finely can we adjust these jets, all that kind of stuff. We have no idea how that's going to work yet. But there it is. The good fiber falls down the waterfall, the bad ones get puffed out of the way, nothing touches the fiber, nothing gets glopped up and has to be cleaned. I think that's how it's going to happen. someone was saying to you, why, why not, don't let the chili go in there in the first place. We're talking about a plant. We're talking about plant. Plant fiber grows in the fields. It's already got light bark and dark bark. There's no machines that can separate that. The same thing, you can build a machine to separate it at this stage, or you build a machine to separate it once it's become soft. It's full of black spots because it is a, you know, it's a plant. Where am I? I gotta keep track of where I am here.
Again, there's nothing I can show you on the camera, just simply now the roughness of the surface has been for the most part gone. The paper, the other thing it, make, it does too is, the, because the paper has now been compressed vertically, it was thick paper to start with, but it's now thinner paper. Nobody would say thin, it's thinner paper, but it has the same amount of components as before. So it was a thick paper that's been pressed, so now it's really, the girls call it jobu, you know, tough, strong. It's got the same amount of fiber in a smaller amount of place. It's really, really tough paper. And once it's been softened with the moisture, it will be glorious to print on this. Uh, we are so, so happy with Iwano-san's paper as paper. There's nothing, you know, negative about that that product and the family making it. It's just simply the frustration from having, you know, you get this far with the print, you make your print, and I'm checking it, and it turns out that there's a bunch of spots in the sky. Nobody wants that. So this is what this whole chili problem is about. The paper is wonderful. If I was doing this and nobody was here and I was home in Ome, I would have the speakers. I, the floor would be shaking. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that there's, under my bench in Ome, there's a woofer under the bench, you know. Uh, it hasn't been turned on in how many years? I don't know. It's probably coated with dust by now. Someone keeps talking about a grabber. I don't know how to describe it to you. As soon as you touch this, the stuff gathers and clumps. Anything that we put into that mix to try and pick something up, it may get the chili, and it's gonna come up with a bunch of white stuff on it, and they will, it will never come off. I had trouble cleaning my fingers. So anything we put into it now has to be totally, thoroughly cleaned. And it's also brought up with it way, way too much mulberry fiber. We can't put anything into the mix. I'm sorry to be negative about suggestions, so no, I'd please keep suggesting, but we can't actually touch it. Someone's asking, said the puff of air may be harsh on the paper. There's no paper at this point, there's fibers. The puff of air is simply gonna take part of this soup and puff it over, and the part that's being puffed is the garbage we don't want. The stuff that's falling through into the bath is the stuff we want to keep. So there really isn't any concern about the puff itself damaging it. Someone's asking about industrial pulp cleaning machines. I don't know anything about this. This is the kind of thing that the, that the union was trying. Other kinds of Japanese fibers, the Mitsumata fiber, can be cleaned industrially. They mix it, turn it into a pulp, chidi inside, it goes into a vat, and what they do is they've got sliding metal things with different slots in it, and a vacuum underneath with a, with a plate, plenum that pulls it down through the thing. And with that one, the, the length of the fibers are short enough that the mulberry can come through the slots and the chili stays up in the shot, slots. The kozo fibers are extremely long and thin, and it makes them too long to go through slots, that kind of stuff. So lots of people have been, you know, lots of people have been trying different things here. So. Someone says, I have the same press, can I flatten paper that is wrinkled after it's sized? I don't know, I don't know. I know if we have paper that's been sized and hung and dried too fast and has a, has a shiwa, has a, has a waviness in it, if we then moisten it and print and dry, after we dry, that waviness will still be there. So if there's waviness in from bad sizing, that's now baked into the sheet itself, and pressing it doesn't help at all. It'll come out of the press flat and then wave up again. So I don't know the specific question here. I don't know. And people are saying centrifuges. If the pulp is loose, small, tiny things, then yes, centrifuge might work. This is long, thin strands.
we'll see as we move forward in this i'll be showing good good lots of video about what we're doing and you'll be able to see some of these things i'm trying to describe them here but you'll be able to see some of these things in future videos in this thing obviously and even the problem as i'm describing it i'm going to try and describe this in the video so that people can make suggestions after i've shown all the reasons why i know it doesn't work so The, the redirection of the chute is something else that we were thinking about and planning about. We didn't actually try it, but the problem there, you've got your chute coming down. And maybe, for example, it drops open at this point, so that the part of the fiber without close. But then that chute has to close again. Or if you've redirected your chute off to a bad area, it's got to close again. And there's fiber still pouring down. And these fibers are super, super long. So anything that has open close, it's going to get caught. Anything goes click, click, open. We thought of one like this. As the chute comes down, the chitty part, it goes open, close. As it's closing, it will catch fiber. This stuff is magic, gluey, magnetic gloop. But yeah, ideas, 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 ideas but you can't touch the white stuff. <laughs> Someone's asking they didn't care about Chidi in Edo times. For cheap paper, they didn't care about it. And there's lots of prints left over from the old days with Chidi all over the place. For top quality work, they did care about it. And Barrett's, Hon Barrett's book, Barrett's Hon oh. Timothy Barrett's book talks about this when he was here in Japan studying in the mid 70s and talking about paper. He, he discusses this in his book, and I can't remember the exact words. I've got the books downstairs. He talks about paper was made in paper making villages, and above them there's the, the domain owner, the lord of the domain, and stuff like this. And nobody's working on a salaried basis. A paper making family, that's all they do, they make paper. They get maybe paid in rice or whatever, and individual people don't get paid by the hour, stuff like this. Simply, your job as a family is to make paper. And Timothy, he describes this better than I'm sort of trying to half remember the story when the requirement was for a beautiful paper for imperial poetry proclamation or something, let's make this up, that had to be perfect, the word came down from upstairs, that next batch of paper you're going to do, it has to be perfect. And this, we're talking about Edo times, and when the guy upstairs says, this next batch of paper must be perfect. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Those people would have worked day, night, day, night, the kids would help everybody. They would pick everything out of this by hand, no matter how many hours it took, no matter anything, because that was the requirement from upstairs. And it wasn't a question of how many hours do we work? Do you get paid over time? Do you do anything? No, it was this paper is going to be white. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So that's the sort of the extreme example of this. There was tons of junk paper made, tons of terrible prints made, but when it was required to be good, it had to be good. And they made it good by hand. Now, Dave is the boss here who wants to make prints at that level. And I'm saying, no bark. Get it? Yes, sir. There's nobody who does that anymore. <laughs> So we're doing this ourselves. We're going to be as strict as is humanly possible with ourselves. I told that story about that, Iwano-san's mother. I, I, I don't know how many times on these streams I can tell the same story. It gets like the old man here, you poke him and he tells the same story so many times in his rocking chair. But the first time I went to Iwamasan to complain about the paper, back when I was making the poets, this would have been in, I don't know, 1996 or 1997 or something, 25 years ago. I had had a batch of paper from Iwamasan that I thought had kind of a lot of bark in it. And on one of my trips up there, I took a roll in my backpack to ask him, like, what's, you know, what can we do about this? Can it be better? 
I get into his house, he sees the roll, his face goes cold. He knows I have brought paper with me, so obviously there's a problem. I put the paper on the table, and I don't remember the words now, because this is 25 years ago. I don't remember the exact words. I look at some of the chi, and he says, he says in something, he says, okay, I got a few things to show you. Come with me. And we go out of his little reception room where he'd been giving me tea. His wife would come and give me tea. We go across the yard to the little, I shouldn't say outhouse. It's not an outhouse. It's a, an outbuilding. It's a little ramshackle outbuilding. It's still there. All the things are there. This is where they do it. This is where they do the chitty. We get to the outbuilding. This is February, January, February, middle of winter. He pulls the door open, and the two of us look inside. And Iwano-san's son is there hunched over the thing, hands in cold water, picking chili. Next to Iwano-san's son, Iwano-san's wife is there, John san's mother, hunched over the cold water. This is February, in the hands, picking chili. Next to them is Iwano-san's mother. Now, Iwano-san at this time, I mean, he, now he's 88, he would have been 68, so his mother would have been 90 or something. She's there, hunched over in the cold water, picking chili. And he just gestured and says, you tell him. You tell him. <laughs> Dave is standing there like this. You know, I'm like... <laughs> That's what I said. In the old days, the boss just said, get that chitty out. And they did it. And now, that's the situation. The, the mother has long died. He wanted to send himself 88 X hours a day. His wife, 86, 85 X hours a day. And Jun San, the son, 56 X hours a day. They sit there with their hands in the app. They divert the stream. The stream comes into the building and out the end. This flowing mountain stream in February. They do this. And he says, You tell her. There's more to the story, actually, too. Yeah, you know, we went in the room and we chatted with him, and he just made sure that I understood how much of, of a difficult work it was. And I guess I could probably say, if I want to sort of dramatize this story, at that moment, that's when Dave's dream realized, I have got to do something about this and make a machine that does this. You know, of course, I don't remember that, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we come out of there, and he says, there's more to show you. And we walked up through the road. They're in the little valley. You know, there, there's, there's a mountain. I mean, we're not talking Alps, but there are mountains right behind them, hills and mountains. And they are partway up this valley. And the water supply here, because the water supply is so important to all the workshops, it's very strictly controlled legally. And most farm areas in Japan, if you're a rice farmer, you've had your water rights for 55 generations, stuff like this. And same it is with this village. They've got their water rights all very carefully worked out. If I moved there, I couldn't just start making paper because I wouldn't have any water rights. It's really, really complex. Anyway, so he walks with me. He takes me up the valley, and there's a water tank at the top. They've been catching the stream water. They want to make sure they've got good supply all year long. So they've got a huge tank up at the top where the water is. And he takes me up there, and we stand there. And again, I, I'm making this up. I remember him telling me this, but I don't remember his words at all, of course, 25 years ago. But I remember the gist of the story. Also, my Japanese was so bad. He stands there by the water tank, and he d makes the gestures around, look at the forest. And he says, look at the forest there. Do you see something? You know, tell me what you see. And I'm like, I look around, and it's, it's, it's forest. Just, you know, it's a mountain forest. And he said, okay, close your eyes and think about now pre-war. How would this have looked like pre-war, back when I was born? He says, when he was born. And I'm like, it's whatever, it's a forest. And he then starts to tell me the story. And you've read about this before. The pre-war Japanese mountainside where he is would have been what's called Zoki Bayashi. It was a mix of hardwoods 
uh, it wasn't a cultivated mountains. The mountains were mostly natural forest. The water came up as water is, no problem. The, the animals live in the forest and away we go. Post-war, this forests have become cultivated forests, and you see this all over Japan. People own each mountainside, they cut it down, they plant cedar trees, because that's what's needed for traditional Japanese housing. So every forest that you see from the train, you see the trees in rows all over Japan, you see this. And it turns out that the water and the soil dramatically change. When you've got nothing but cedar trees, you know, and what are they called? Not deciduous, the you know, conifers. The water becomes acidic. The leaves fall down, they don't rot into a nice mat of soil. The whole mountain changes and the water becomes more acidic. So he tells me, this water, I can't drink this, it's so bad. When I was a kid, it was blah, blah, blah. Then he gestures up to the sky. He says, you know where the prevailing winds come from? They come from Asia across here. Do you know what SO2 means? And he explains sulfur dioxide, Chinese uh, power generation stations filling the air with sulfur dioxide, whatever. The point of his story was the entire environment that I'm working with, the entire planet from his point of view has dramatically changed. And again, I don't remember the word. He said, you want Edo era paper, then get your time machine because the soil is different, the air is different, everything is different. Let's go home and get some lunch, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So, he was right, I guess he was right. I am the odd man out. I'm living in 2022, but I'm trying to order paper from 1922 or 1822. And of course it's impossible. The odd man out here is me. And from Iwano-san's point of view, he just wishes I would just shut up, make good prints, and just get with it. And I guess he's right, but, 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 but. Thick. If I gave this to Kubota-san, he'd just go, oh my god, oh my god, Dave, I'm not 35, I'm 75. <laughs> Somebody in the street here was worried, Dave, don't talk, get your work done, get your work done. I am going to have a very, very peaceful day today, actually. Today, for me, I've got to do these 88 sheets, get them wrapped up, that's no problem, it'll take me an hour or so, whatever. And then today on my schedule, actually, it's just a, a recap of yesterday's experiments, got to make some notes. I'm going to try and catch up on email. So today, actually, is going to be a peaceful day. There's no dots on the fridge. There's no paper out. And the weather's nice, I'm going to take a walk. So today's day for me is going to be a peaceful, non-stressed, try and catch up with emails, maybe not so successfully, I don't know. So please don't worry about my time and stuff today. You know. Ayano-san, she and I will be you know, doing some stuff this afternoon, I guess. It's her last chance to talk to Cameron today. So maybe actually that's what we'll be doing this morning. And maybe actually I can't get a walk after all because Ayano-san will be here today. So we'll be going, she'll want to go through lots of stuff this afternoon. So, so maybe a no walk, but whatever. Anyway, but a peaceful, peaceful, happy day. Might even do a bit of video editing on some of the stuff we got yesterday. It was so much fun yesterday, you know. <laughs>
the other part of this too, we've been planning this, you know, bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. And the other day, Aoyama-san and I, I don't remember what day it was or something. We've been getting ready, and I think it was Wednesday or something, we said, look, what are we going to do? We're going to talk forever. Are we going to do this thing or not? You know. So it must have been maybe Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday morning or something. So they, oh, said, okay, what's the date? Friday, you get time Friday? Friday, Friday. So we, this would be on Wednesday. We booked Friday for the first experiment day. So there I am, Wednesday afternoon. Okay, we're going to do this on Friday. What do I need? Uh, no, the, the, we had an aluminum pot here. You can't use an aluminum pot when you're boiling alkali in it. So we needed a better pot. So I just strolled up the road to Kapabashi, and I found a big pot, and I found a basket to strain in, stroll back down. Uh, the, what I'm trying to say is we're just in the world's best place for doing this. I want a stainless steel pot. I stroll up the road five minutes, got it, come back. We're going to start buying electric relays next week, whatever, for, for shooting these puffs of air, compressed air. Hmm, I need a relay, 12 volt, blah, blah, blah. Get on the train, one station to Wakabara, come back. We're in the world's best place for doing this. If I were out in Ome, my God, I got no access to anything. But here in Asakusa, I couldn't design a better place to be setting up these experiments. Also, we figured out how to how to get the you know, division of labor. Based on yesterday's tests, we're going to build Mark Zero, which just has a little tank, one track of waterfall, and we're going to use just a compressed can of air to try the puffing. If it looks like it's going to work, then we will proceed with building a first machine, Mark 1. And Aoyama-san is going to build the machine, and I'm going to build the software. So we're going to do it this way. <laughs> Patented? No. Everything's going to be open source. Everything, everything, everything. There's no market here to sell shitty machines. There's only five or six households in the whole country who could possibly use it. So there's no market. We're going to build it, and the first point is, the idea is to help Iwano-san. And he may not even go along with this. That's the other aspect of this, you know. When we've built our Mark I machine, and have it, have it up and running, he actually won't be able to use it. He's a living national treasure. He can't dramatically alter his production process that much. His customers wouldn't want this. The idea Dave is planning, fine, we get the chitty taken out, we get a clean white sheet of paper, but maybe I've damaged the mulberry and 30 years later it goes brown. We don't know. So he can't change his production. So first step is we're going to build it and then we are going to interrupt his production when he's making our batches of paper. We're going to have him prepare the mulberry bark for a batch of paper for us. We're going to stop, freeze it, bring it over here, run it through our machine, send it back to him, finish making the paper. That's all he can do. He can't do this for his other customers, not at this stage. So we have to be the guinea pigs. We understand this. We take the full risk ourselves. We're the guinea pigs. And hopefully, if he sees what's happening and he sees that paper, he's going to say, Maybe we can maybe we can use this. Or maybe some other workshop, maybe the Kitaro workshop across the street from him. We don't know. All we care about at the moment is to get this up and running for ourselves. We don't think it will become an industry standard because those guys will be too nervous about changing their process. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure about the Arduino thing. Somebody's mentioning Arduino. I may or may, I may not be. The little relays that we're going to use to do the jets, it seems like most of them are things like 12 volts, some are 3 volts, whatever. So I need uh, a, the, the logic board set that will drive relays at 12 volts, which sounds like an Arduino. Except that I also found another unit yesterday when I was browsing uh, Alibaba. There's a unit that takes, you know, works by Wi-Fi with your computer or phone or whatever, and it takes the logic input and it will output 12 volt signals. It sort of, I guess it probably has an Arduino built into it or something, I have no idea. So we may not need the actual Arduino or Raspberry Pi itself. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, 
now something else is happening here. We've done what? We've done 10, 12, 15 sheets. It's getting easier to flow through because what's happening is this felt has been bit by bit by bit getting compressed. Now, I've got no idea about printmakers. Maybe they have to do this as well. But as we go through this job bit by bit, I have to tighten it ever so slightly because the felt has become more compressed and there's not enough pressure on the paper. Have I worked with Chandler? I know nothing about printing presses. This is the only printing press I have ever touched in my life. I'm sorry, I have, I have no experience. The kind of printing we do is all by hand. I am using this press only for calendaring. So I'm sorry, I have no advice whatsoever. I've never touched in my life any other kind of press, I'm sorry. Should we switch to some videos then? Let's do that. Let's switch to some videos. What's the time? 8.51. Yeah, let's do that. Let's switch to some videos. Should we do that? Videos, videos, videos. Okay, what I've got, I've got two videos first that are already embedded into the OBS system here. So I'll be able to play those, and I think they come through with sound properly. We tried this the other day. I've also got the camera connected. The camera that you're, that's right now, that is uh, this camera, has the stored video from yesterday. So we'll look at a couple of those and take piece by piece by piece. First, let's see. Here's the concept. You've seen me do sizing. Oh, too large, yeah? Have you seen its measurement? Hi, 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 hi. Okay, I think you can hear my voice and a little bit of background noise from the video, I believe. This is the fiber. We have tons and tons and tons of it here. And this is Thursday night. We did our baking, our cooking, Friday morning yesterday. This is Thursday evening. It's about 10 o'clock at night. I finished a batch of sizing. The water in the machine there actually is a little bit warm. So I put 250 grams. We measured exactly 250 grams of dry kozel, went into the water to soak. I've known about paper making. I've been studying paper making for a long time. And the fiber, the new fiber, if it was just fresh new fiber it doesn't really need this but this is old fiber three four years old it's hard and brittle and here we are this is now the next morning this is friday morning the fiber has been soaking overnight in the warm water and this is now the white inside bark and we can already see you can see the black dots there here and there here and there there's black dots there's hard specks this is actually pretty good Ah, oh, too loud. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Good. Okay, just a minute. Let's go back a bit then. Okay. Sorry about the audio there. Excuse me. There's so many settings here. This is actually really, really clean. And they've done a very good job. They've the voicing, that's the inside surface. And this is the outside surface. The black bark was against this, and this is where they have scraped away. The black bark has been scraped off this surface. And yes, they've already excised a bit. You'll see holes here and there where they have chopped out bits and pieces of it. There are places where there is still some left. So stage one sheety removal has already been done here. And at this stage, perhaps, or not here, but back at the place where we buy it from, this could perhaps be automated to a degree. We don't know. But they have done a very, very good job. This is extremely clean chitty. And it's a problem for part of us because we want dirty chitty here to be able to use our machine to test with. Okay, those two videos are from the, the store on, on my computer. Let's now go to the camera itself. One sec, please.
Good morning, good morning. Morning. Oh, sorry, we're, we're live here. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear the audio from the video? This is the, I uh, no, what do you call it? Calcium carbonate. Na2CO3 going in. And we have a carefully calculated balance. We have 12 liters sodium carbonate 12 liters of water exactly brought to a boil, 50 grams. We're using a formula given by Barrett in his book. Barrett gives lots and lots of information about this. So we have just barely boiling water and in goes the alkali mixture. And you know what happens next? The next step is And it's, the solution didn't seem to be too strong. I know some workshops do it with caustic soda, which is you can't touch it, you need glasses and stuff like this. This is just calcium carbonate, and it seems that there's not too much danger in this. So. Okay, this is the start now, and we carefully time this. for two hours. And again, this is based on a recipe from Tim Barrett's book from the 1970s. This, the ash would have been used the stage before this. The ash is used to make the alkali mixture. Here, to make the alkali mixture, we use the powdered. But the traditional way is not dumping in your powder, it's making your alkali soup first, is the traditional way. And again, following Barrett's recipe, he said every, do it for two hours and every 30 minutes, come in here and turn the thing upside down. Make sure that the bottom is on the top and the top is on the bottom. And it's really, really softened up, very much softened up. There was an aroma. It didn't smell. I know, it didn't smell tasty. It smelled like you're boiling some kind of vegetable or something. And this is this is plant fiber. I can't say mmm tasted like soup, but there was the, the room got filled with the the scent of something that was sort of cooking, cooking grassy, a grassy type of smell. And we did the same thing. I set timers very carefully. We we're trying to do this exactly, exactly as per all the instructions, because we're, we're, we're flying blind here. And we did the same thing. Every 30 minutes, in I go, turn it a bit, flip it over. Brand new kitchen pot, cost me 11,000 yen, just about $100, from a place in Kapabashi. There were some so expensive ones there. My God, they were expensive. I struggled to be able to find one that I could afford here. You say expensive pot. That was the cheapest one I could find. I walked up and down Kapabashi. And I was thinking, am I buying a piece of junk? I don't know. I think not many households would use a pot, 12 liters. And it's, so it's restaurant stuff. So you're paying, you're paying restaurant prices. You know. You can't use aluminum. It's got to be steel. It's got to be stainless steel. And even um, a cast iron is no good because the iron, you don't want iron particles in your stuff. Stainless steel. And at each time I turned it, we used some chopsticks. We pulled out a fiber to have a look at it. And we were, you know, seeing, and again, going by Barrett's information, 
here we are. The two hours has passed now. Now there's two hours missing because two hours of cooking passed. We turned the heat off, left it covered, and we let it sit for two more hours. And this is an unknown. How long to do this for? This is where it's based on experience, which we have none. Leave it too long, the fibers will lose their strength in the finished paper. Do it too quickly and they won't separate. This is where we are now going to build our experience stage by stage by stage. And also we were, we were told, we looked at this, we think we can put this straight down the drain. The alkali solution is not that strong. In fact, here I'm taking a sample for pH testing. And after it cooled, we tested it, and it came out at 9, I forget, I made notes, 9.75. So this is not a skin-burning alkali. We're looking at 9 point something. So it can go down the drain with no problem. And we're documenting everything within a fraction of its life. We're documenting everything. So someone says, spill on my feet. It's not here, I did, I <laughs> just spill it on my feet. <laughs> But again, this is, you know, this is not the life-threatening stuff. We're not wearing goggles or, or hand protection. Alkali of nine something is, is no big deal. And this again now, we weren't sure what to do. The, the textbook case here is you rinse, rinse again, throw the water, rinse again, throw the water, rinse again, throw the water, until you get to the point where the water is clear and you're, the water coming off is back to the same uh, alkalinity, the same pH as where we started. And our top water here is 7.5. So the idea was to rinse this three, four, five times until we got down to 7.5 in our outtake. We didn't go that far because we don't want this fiber to be weakened too much. Cameron's here. Good morning, Cameron. Ah, he's come in because Ayama-san, he and Ayama-san must be talking downstairs. So Cameron's going to have Ayama-san. He's got his, he's got the, you know, uh, here we go. let's have a look at this. Now, it separates horizontally, of course, dead easy. And Barrett's advice was not only horizontally, it must also separate vertically with only the slightest tug. And here we go, Dave is tugging, and there it did, it came apart. It had a bit more resistance than I thought it would have at this point. Two hours cooking, overnight pre-soaking, two hours cooking, and then two hours steeping. And I thought it would come apart like, uh, like tissue paper. It didn't. And that's our last rinse. The water is not completely clear, but there is another heavy, heavy washing stage coming up. Is it one more? Sorry, I thought it was one more. The length of the fibers here, Kozo, I'm told, is anywhere from 5 to 15 millimeters long. It's the Kozo fiber itself. Other pulps, Mitsumata is 3 millimeters long or so. Gampi is a different process. But again, pH testing here. That was our last test for the pH. We had trouble calibrating this thing. My God, we had trouble calibrating it. So it, the pH hasn't really changed that much. It's been through three washings now, and it really wasn't changing. So at this point, we're thinking, what shall we do? What shall we do? Remember, we are not actually going to make paper with this batch. The mulberry you're seeing here will not be turned into finished sheets of paper. The mulberry sheets, the mulberry you see here is going to be used to test the chili tori machine. And by testing, it's going to be in the water, washed, in the water, washed. So this mulberry is going to end up with all the strength taken out of it. 
The baby's asking, no more litmus paper. We're gonna get some. I've ordered from Amazon some litmus paper because this machine was just trouble, trouble, trouble. The on-off button and the calibration button are side by side. We calibrate it at once. You put it in the solution, you calibrate it, and it turns out that if you hold it in the air and accidentally press the calibration button, it takes the air reading as being the basic calibration, and it says, nope, sorry, error, go back and do all your calibration all over again. This is an awful little machine. The two buttons are side by side, so Aoyama-san put a sticker on it there, don't touch this button. Okay, I think this is the last one. Up we go. This is the last one. So I think somebody's staying here. So a, a good electric meter would be wonderful. We don't have the ability to calibrate it. So, and also we don't need to know 9.12 or 9.13. It's nothing that we need that level. We just need a general mood for the alkalinity. Who's the guy wearing mask? It's me. You're seeing video of me. And the reason I wore a mask yesterday while doing this is because there were two of us standing there, myself and Aoyama-san. That's me, you're looking at me there. My hair was whiter yesterday. I don't know. <laughs> Different color balance. At this point, we sort of realized it really isn't going to change much at this point. So we just cut and run. We moved ahead to the next step, and you are now going to see persuading like you have never seen persuading before. You've seen persuading on the stream downstairs. Hang on now. In the next little clip here, you're going to see some persuading. So they're trying to think what to do. Do it again or get busy beating. I was trying to make my decision on what to do. Here we go. And actually, we, we did this actually quite well, you know. If we were set up for making paper, I think we could successfully go ahead and make some paper here, you know. I don't know how good it would be, but uh, we've done enough research and enough study and enough preparation. We could actually make paper here. You know. There's lots of automation at this point in various factories. You know, out there, there are automated stampers, there are automated beaters, there are Hollander beaters. There are any number of ways to do this. Iwano-san still does it by hand for the simple reason that he does it until it's just right. So part of this could indeed be automated. Now we're not going to sit and watch this. This went on for 25 minutes, so we'll just look at a little bit. Very interesting question. How many sheets would this make? I don't know. Of course, size-wise, thickness, there's many, many variables, but our typical kind of paper, how many sheets would this make? I have no idea yet. I'm sorry. I don't know. We'll learn more about that as it goes on. Number 33, Louisville. It's that kind of a feel. It's that kind of a heft. It has to have corners. It can't be round. It's got to have corners. But not too sharp, because too sharp corners will cut. How much does one sheet typically weigh? This is wet, wet, dry. I don't know.
if I were just going to take a wild guess of the type of paper we're making, I would guess, you know, the, the, the paper about this size, I would guess around 20 sheets or so. But I may be way off, way off. I don't know. Yeah, look at the extension cord in the water. I'm sorry, whatever, okay. <laughs> yes, point taken, I'm sorry. So exactly where we spilled that liquid too. Now, if it's a round bat, it's all, all pressing just on one point. It has to be flat to hit hard. If the corners are too sharp, it can cut the fiber. So you need a flat bat like this with the corners on the irises taken off the corners. And there's a, there's a song, there's, Iwano-san has got this. There's a, a, what do you do? You're supposed to hit three times in one place. Once, twice, bang, move half. Once, twice, bang. I've watched them do this. Then you reverse pass, then you swivel it around. It's like making pastry to an extent. Do we have neighbors? We're okay, we're in a concrete building. I think probably we'll, we'll leave it there because this goes on, as I said, this goes on now for 25 minutes and there's nothing else really to see. At the end of it, maybe I can try and find the last video in this stream. Oh, here we are, no, maybe this piece. No, no. Just water. It was getting a bit too dry. And the, the instructions we've got that if it's too dry, the fibers break and get damaged. If it's too wet, it splashes all over the room. And there's lots of video. If you go on YouTube, there's people doing this all over the place on YouTube. Absolutely. Okay, let's try and find the last one. Hang on a sec. This was after 25 minutes. And how, what kind of dispersion do we have now? And it looks like we have got total, complete dispersion. You really can't see anything. There are fibers in there. Fibers all floating around. Nothing seems to be clumped. Everything seems to have separated. Mission accomplished. Stage one of our machine here. back to where we were. Shot glass, it was just a piece of plastic. So there we are. So the idea now, as I said, we're not going to make paper. We now know we can do the first part. We can get mulberry fiber, which still has the dirt and chitty in it. We can now get pretty much complete total dispersion there. Mission accomplished. Next step is to build a machine which will flow that stuff through some channels catch the points where there is garbage, arrange an air jet to puff it out, leaving just the fiber with no garbage. That then goes to the next step, which of course is paper making. Of course, at some point in the future, we're gonna do it ourselves. But right now, the basic idea is to build a machine that will help the Iwano-san family make their paper, make their paper for us. Okay, it's 9.15. Did we get this right or did we get this right? The pulp we made yesterday is now in the... Here it is. Frozen. Frozen solid. Because that stuff now is delicate and fragile. Delicate and fragile. You can't mix it too much, you can't bash it too much, and in water it will lose its strength. I'm learning about the science of this. It's cellulose. The, the alkali boiling got rid of the lignin, leaving just cellulose. Washing it too much will remove too many of what's called hemicelluloses. I'm, I'm learning bit by bit about how this goes. 
if all the hemicelluloses are, are removed, the paper will have no strength whatsoever. If there's too many left behind, it's food for the bugs, whatever. It's starch, I guess, is what it amounts to, the hemicelluloses, I don't know. Iwano-san would never freeze his, ever. We're freezing at this point because, as I said, we're not trying to make paper here. We are experimenting. Okay, let's look at show and tell. It looks like we're going to do it right here on this spot. I should crack off the pressure. That's another thing, too, with this press. I should have done this when we stopped a few minutes ago. We don't leave the pressure on the roller, of course. Crack off the pressure. little show and tell today. We have two things to show. We're not looking at the scroll. We're putting the scroll away. The scroll is downstairs. We can pick it up again another day, another day. Yeah, we'll talk about hemicellulosis later. That's, that's going to be the biggest question mark on this. If we can clean this fiber without removing too many of the hemicelluloses. And right now, I think we've taken away too many. Because if we wash this now some more, they will disappear. And the answer is going to be less cooking or less rinsing or less pre-soaking so that we don't end up with paper that's got those, that's got no hemicellulose. Okay, we've got two things. We've got one of those magazines left that we saw the other day. But before that, we have a nice little cute item that arrived here. Let's have a look. This has actually been waiting downstairs. It's a book from the old days. This might be Taisho, might be Meiji. We'll find out when we get inside. And the book itself is not made from woodblock printing. But it has inside it print or prints, and the cover is also printed woodblock. It's not Hasegawa, so this is not one of those gorgeous, wonderful Chidi Men books. This is just an ev average, everyday, go to the bookstore, let's buy a book. Now, it's not a kid's book for children, ABC kid's book, but it's a book about kids, and I guess it might be, what do you call it these days? Young, the fiction for kids like who are 12 years old or something like this, what's it called? Young, young people's fiction or something, I don't know, this is, this is a generic name for this kind of stuff. Young adult, bingo, young adult or whatever. It's this kind of stuff, it seems. First, the cover of the book is, of course, a woodblock print. Oh, let's get a date. Before we, before we go, let's get a date. Let's go to the back. Advertising, advertising, advertising. Advertising, advertising, advertising. Here's the date. Okay. Can't wear up my glasses. Oh, Jesus, they're on. Dave. It's Meiji 25, oh, the first, look at this, interesting. It's Meiji 25, and it's uh, the 11th of January is the legal publication date. And the book itself, this is not a woodblock print. This, the book itself is made with metal type. And it's done in a real big form. All the type is super large, and everything that's a kanji has what's called rubi, or furigana, put next to it to help people read it. This is a semi-kids book. It's not a kids book like for five years old, but it's a book for kids that can basically read most basic stuff. And the content, I guess, too, is children's content. And the front cover is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woodblock print. As is the inside. And this must be made, one sec here. Yeah, this is made as a single piece, the front cover and the inside. And everything about this thing smells of the new year. The front picture 
had a winter scene. The things here you're seeing, the kite is a symbol of the new year, and the, 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 sort of the thing that looks like a badminton game, what's it called? I forget the Japanese name for it. It's also a game that's played at the new year. And then inside it, we have a kuchie, a frontispiece picture, woodblock print. And it's classic Meiji era, and it is so nicely made. We've got the typical shininess on the black parts. If I get the angle right, you'll see the umbrella looks lacquered. Gradations at the bottom of the kimono. And this will be the younger brother. It's, a, it's a, obviously an older sister and a younger brother. Beautifully, beautifully, beautifully done. There was never any better or carving printing in the history of Japanese prints than in this era. Those last years of the Meiji era and this is a frontispiece in a sort of throwaway kid's book. And it's a gorgeous, gorgeous Japanese woodblock print. And this cost me next to nothing. I forget the auction, five bucks, 10 bucks. Nobody's interested in these things. Nobody wants these. Can I get the right angle? It is, there's Shomen Zuri on it, but I can't find the right angle here, just a sec. Somewhere here, there's an angle, I don't know. <laughs> It's shining from where I can see it, but I can't get it to see shine for you guys. Sorry, it's there somewhere. <laughs> There's a pattern in the umbrella ribs. I gotta find this, give me a minute to find this. There's a pattern, the umbrella ribs come through to the front. There it is, there it is, we got it? It's in there, sorry around here. It's, it's all exactly the light, you know? Look at this. You can see the ribs of the umbrella. Very nice. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The content of the story, I have no idea. It just says, you know, sister and brother is the name of the title. No idea. It's actually readable with all the help from the from the Furigana. It's actually readable. What did it cost? I don't know, about $10, about a thousand yen auction, I guess. I just, I bid on some of these because I want some examples in our collection, but we can't sell stuff like this. So it just goes through, goes through, goes through. Very nice, very, very, very nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. We saw these magazines the other day. Remember, we looked at the first one, which was not so interesting. Then we looked at the next one, which was interesting. And I can't remember now which one we've looked at and which one we haven't seen. So one second. That one we did see. This one, I think, was the first one, not so interesting. Yes, that one. So we have one left of the three magazines to look at. <clears throat> Do we have a date here? One second. We do have a date. Again, Meiji 29, the first day of the fourth month. April 1st, Meiji 29. And this was a monthly magazine. We've seen them before. This is, we got a batch of three of them a while ago. This is the third one. April Fool's Day, so I rather doubt they were doing April Fool's back at that time. Again, for those of you who've never seen these, seen these before, this is a, uh, it's a design idea book. It's people who bought this book would be people in some kind of arts, the fashion field or, or lacquerware or anything. People that had a need for looking at and playing with and studying design motifs. 
and the book would be heavily used. There's like somebody saying thumb sponges. It's been used, and it's got the name stamped on here of a dying workshop. This is Somme No, I can't read the third one. So this book would have been purchased by people who are working in a dyer, you know, fabric and, and fabric design. And this would have been in their library in their, in their company, and it would have been referred to by people who were, you know, making kimono designs or fabric designs or handkerchiefs, you name it. No idea. Gradation, gradation, gradation. And what you're looking at is woodblock prints, but not made for the purpose of art, just for the purpose of communicating design ideas. Small pleasure for us, that's all. It's funny too, we got these three volumes and the first one we opened up a couple of weeks ago was terribly printed and it was bad and I thought I had some lemons, but they, they're getting better and better, the three volumes. And the first one was terrible. These are quite nicely made. It's come apart. It's been handled so many times. These would have been joined together originally. Again, this is Chidori, the plover motif. We saw it. Cranes, standard patterns in Japanese art. <laughs> Also, it looks like it's faded. There's some kind of pattern in here. I don't think it's, I think it's gone. I think they printed some kind of pattern with Gofun, and whoever did it didn't use quite enough glue, and it's now pretty much gone. So there would have been, there's some kind of white floral pattern here. I can't, I can't catch what it is. No idea. Very badly printed. That's what you get after a hundred years. This one is interesting. It's coming up just at a time. <coughs> you saw me carve the dragon picture for this year's series, right? It's going to be five small prints side by side, and it's a dragon, and the dragon flows across different pictures. And they've done something like that here, and I can't decide if these are trying to be the same thing. They've flown these things. It's as though we were looking at some horizontal windows and we see plants outside it, but they don't all flow through. So I'm not quite sure what they've done here. These two certainly seem to flow, or maybe not. Maybe they're five individual pictures. I don't know. We've got our first cut sample of the dragon. I can't show you, the girls are printing it now, and I stole one the other day, took it down to my bench and chopped it up. So I've, I've seen the first sample of the cut dragon, and it's fun. It's fun, it's fun, it's fun. It's really nice. Jed has done a really, really nice, simple job on this. Someone's asking, are the yellow spots discoloration? No, they've printed, it's a, it's a hotaru, they've, it's a butterflies. It's not hotaru, it's butterflies. They've printed yellow butterfly wings. I thought it was supposed to be Hotaru. No, it's butterflies. There's even one up here off the frame. No, I'm not sure what they're doing here. I believe they're supposed to be butterflies, although my first guess would have been uh, n n fireflies. They're butterfly shapes. This is a very opaque pigment. And there's something here in aluminum, aluminum powder. And what's the game? I mean, what's going on here, right? What's this? This is a cherry blossom. Got it? What's this? You tell me. I have no idea. I mean, the idea is to play 
play with motifs, play with designs, but like even as a part-time Japanese like I am, mixing cherry blossoms and maple leaves in one picture, I really not quite sure how this comes. <laughs> Have they done the same thing here then? Bamboo is usually a summer feeling. This might be indicating a pumpus grass, autumn feeling, and yet we have plum blossoms. So I don't know. Either somebody has hit the bottle a bit too hard, or it's the game. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. They're pleasant. It's just small pleasure, so it's quiet pleasure, you know. But this is definitely more involved than the first book we saw. The first book really was uh, was quite simple. You know. And a free freestyle gradations, ate nashi bokashi. The printer just rubbed pigment in various places on almost on a blank plot. The excavations have started. The building construction next door, where they took the building down, they are now excavating the foundations for the new building. They're digging into the concrete that's left under there. So for the next week or so, it's it's on a power hammers. It's power hammers morning till night for the next week or so. They told us this is nice. Never know. You turn page by page, and you never, never, never have any idea what's coming up on the next page. This is riffing on the screen behind which would be sat an emperor. I carved lots of these when I was carving my poets. I've carved dozens of these. This screen and below it, behind it, there would have been an emperor sitting. It's a very uh, hay and era motif. I guess this is reminiscent of butterflies again. I don't know. And then the final picture, a little bit bland, I don't know. So there we go. I know, as you said, it's Meiji 29. These are all published by the famous Unsodo company, which still exists in Kyoto. They're on Teramachi Street in Kyoto. They don't do stuff like this anymore, that's for sure. But my God, they've got a long history. Incredible, incredible, incredible history. <laughs> to find a book like this on auction, what would you look for? I really don't know. If you want this particular book, you search for the name. It's Bijutsu Kai. It's Beauty Arts C. Bijutsu Kai. Umi was, gives you the name of this thing. But there were many, many, many similar magazines published over the years. John's saying not very hospitable. No, they're dead. They're a shell of what they were. No. But they were the biggest and best. They were an astonishing publisher. I've seen pictures of their block storage room. Uh, we, I said this before. It looks like the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Shelf after shelf after shelf, moving into the distance of dark, dusty stuff with treasures inside. Absolutely incredible place. But dead, dead. Okay, I am... Um, out of here. I got to talk to Ayano-san and Cameron for a few minutes. I got to finish pressing. Got to get some more planning. Might take a walk this afternoon. I don't know. I'll see you in two more days. I don't know if I'll have new video to show you because I might not be actually, you know, doing more on the project yet. I've got to head to Akihabara, think about some programming. Not really sure what we'll show. Anyway, here we are. Here we go. I have no outside camera to show you, so we're just going to have to end like this. Thank you very much. It's been fun for me today, you know, just doing something a little bit different from our normal stuff. See you soon in a couple of days. Bye for now. Where's the button? Stop.